You recently published a video that basically articulates why the current status of the ETH merge, and this is a quote from your tweet, is a monumental blunder. Can you like quickly summarize your, your main thesis for those that haven't watched the video yet? Sure. So to, to get beyond the, uh, the clickbaity title, I do believe it's a monumental <laughs> blunder. Um, I think it's kind of the end of the line of a series of blunders. But essentially, um, they've done a lot of work um, on the engineering side to make proof of stake function. Proof of stake is technologically far more complex than proof of work, both at a code level, at a consensus level, at a number of modules that need to be running in, co in um, cohesion. It's a complex beast. So you can do all of this engineering work. You can spend, in this instance, since 2016, years and years and years of technical investment to solve this problem. And if you leave a gaping open hole, that means that all of that work is for void anyway, then you're, you're stuffed up. So what I tried to demonstrate in this video, and it's, it's, it's a culmination of many ideas and things I've seen for a long time, and it was crystallized by two events. Um, the first one was the tornado cache event, um, which we'll touch on in a sec. The second one was uh, a tweet that actually Lynn Alden put out, which kind of really just solidified it to me, um, which was basically a flipping case, um, which I'm actually allied with, to be honest. Um, basically, she's saying, you know, Ethereum could become fully centralized, fully regulated, fully captured, like the treasury market, and the treasuries are bigger than the gold market, right? Bitcoin takes the decentralized gold approach. Um, the rea I think the statistics are something like 10% of people align with libertarianism. I know there's more people coming from different political ideologies into Bitcoin, but generally speaking, that's been the crowd that's attracted so far. Um, so you're talking about Bitcoin having a 10% mind share versus the fiat system, which has a 90% mind share. Bitcoin's going to get flipped, right? So that's the argument. So the tornado cash thing to me was new information, um, not in the sense that it couldn't have been seen coming, but in the sense that um, it came to light, right? It became a real thing, and now we can actually talk about it and see the ramifications. So what I tried to document in that video was many layers of problems and essentially, they've done all this layered technology to make proof of stake work. But the gap that exists is can your consensus mechanism in proof of stake be captured, which means that someone else owns that infrastructure. So to kind of lay out the, the core points, um, and to be fair, I, I actually wrote an article. It's not all the points, but it's a good chunk of them. Um, way back when Bankless didn't even have a paywall, uh, back in their very, very early days, I wrote an article. Um, it was a why ETH won't sustain a monetary premium back in January 2020. Um, and Vitalik himself actually responded to it. So, you know, it's, it's, it at least got some kind of attention. And I outlaid a lot of these ideas, right? Um, basically, Ethereum is constantly changing. There's risk in terms of monetary policy. Um, there's a centralization vector on these apps. And what we've essentially seen play out is the realization of a lot of these risks. They, they weren't dealt with. So to kind of list them out, the first one, I think, Stake was always destined to centralize. Um, now, in proof of work, if a miner is in, if 40% of the miners are in America, 40% are, I don't know, somewhere in, in Asia, China, and Kazakhstan, and 20% are in, you know, Venezuela, Iran, places like that, um, countries that um, America isn't overly friendly with. If you mine an OFAC, uh, if you want to send a transaction from a sanctioned address, well, the American miners, they don't have to mine it. They can choose not to mine it. We saw this with Marathon. They said, yeah, we're doing OFAC. But the guys over in Iran, or the guys in Venezuela, they'll gladly mine that block, that transaction. They don't care. Let's go. Um, so they will gladly mine it, and then it's, it's in the blockchain, build on top, carry on. Um, if the government says you can't even mine on those blocks, well, then the US mining industry goes to zero. They move somewhere else, like we saw in China. What happens? Move on. Proof of stake... Well, energy is diverse. Energy is everywhere. It's all over the place. And as we know, Bitcoin seeks out the cheapest wasted stranded energy, which is everywhere. Capital is heavily centralized in America because it's deepest liquid capital markets, most VCs, most capital to flow around. And what we have seen empirically is that Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, Lido, all these services that offer convenience to their user, users that don't have 32 ETH, so they have to pull, um, users who just want convenience, which is a lot. Um, uh, the, all the, the network effects of minor extractable value and all these kind of technical reasons why you earn more network effects, essentially, economies of scale, you will earn more in a pool. Um, there's a lot of reasons why little Timmy is not going to stake, you know, I, I use the case, 
ETH could go to 10K, right? Which is where the bulls want it to go. 10K times 32 ETH is 320 grand. Timmy, the average person, is not putting $320,000. I know I wouldn't, and I'm technically savvy. I wouldn't put that on my laptop and let it run on my kitchen counter in my cupboard. No, sorry. I'm delegating that risk. Um, some of the ETH influencers even said, um, there's a tweet in my video that basically says, you know, um, watch out, solo stakers. It's, it's possible that OFAC may come for, for you, the solo staker, and say, you can't mine that block. I mean, little Timmy's going straight to Binance and saying, take that risk away from me. I don't want to touch it. So there's a lot of reasons why stake will centralize. And the empirical evidence is it already has. 